Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I have Kevin Curley here. Kevin, what's going on? Tom, it appears the IRS does not take summer vacations. They are busy issuing all kinds of new rules about the SECURE Act. They say you can take an emergency fund without a penalty. They're changing the rules about uh, inherited IRAs and clarifying them. So while everybody else is on the beach, the IRS is out there issuing rules left and right. I guess they weren't affected by uh, this crowd strike <laughs> and the shutdown with the blue screen of death. My wife's car's in the shop. And well, we'll they were have... like, we can't work on it today because we don't have a computer. It's like, wait, what do you use the computer for? <laughs> what does that have to do with fixing a yeah, cable? Hold shocking. on. <laughs> yeah. Well, for our next pod, maybe we'll we'll do a whole conversation around those those changes that are potentially in place. But for... For today, we'll talk about a topic that comes up quite a bit, and that is how much do you need to retire and what type of strategies that uh, you have in place to do that. We'll do our central bank roundup, talk about some interest rates and conversations there, and then one with our something or nothing segment. So let's jump into the planning topic. So Kevin, how much do I need to retire and what does that look like? I'm going to give you the answer every accountant gives to every client when they ask a question. It depends, which I learned that one from Ben Murphy. Um, but today, I'd, I'd say let's focus on withdrawal rates. And so people have heard of the 4% rule. Um, there's been a lot of studies done uh, and says it works pretty well over a 30-year horizon. Um, what I found, and this uh, comes from some research done by uh, Michael Kitsis, is that real number is actually 3.6%. If you're working for working with an advisor who's charging an advisory fee and also account for taxes, that you can expect a 50-50 asset allocation over 30 years uh, to work every time. Uh, now, there are a couple exceptions. Those exceptions were uh, countries you wouldn't be surprised by. So if you closed your stock market and had, let's say, a communist revolution, didn't work out. If you were one of the belligerents in World War II, Japan and Germany, didn't work out during that period. Um, but otherwise, we found that the safe withdrawal rate, that magic number is not 4%. It's actually 3.6%. So let's let's elaborate on that a little bit. When you say 3.6%, you have an IRA, you have some investment accounts, you roll over a 401k, you take all your investable assets that are in the market and you draw a 3.6% rate of return off that. So if you have a million dollars, you're looking at $36,000 a year mm -hmm. in income. That's exactly right. And so this is really, this safe withdrawal rate is focused on your portfolio. And so if you think of a, uh, a balanced asset allocation, which the classic one's the 60-40, which we've talked about before, and somebody like yourself might say that portfolio is dead, but for all the research, it does say, hey, it has worked. Um, and hopefully the future, not predicted by the past, but it's a pretty good guide to say, okay, well, what has worked in the past? Has it worked to have the type of portfolio? And the answer has been that the answer is yes. Now, when you're building out your retirement income, you want to get it from multiple places. So let's say you do that quick math and you use 3.6 or use 4% just as a benchmarking before you do a full financial plan with you know a CFP like Tom or myself. And you kind of go, well, am I close? Am I in range? And you go, well, I'm not, I'm not quite there uh, for what I need to retire. What you might find is, well, what if you add in Social Security uh, and waiting until your full retirement age? What if you also have a pension at work or maybe you have passive, in passive income from a rental property? Um, and if not, are you willing to do some type of part time work? Uh, and that's kind of how we build the retirement income picture. Yeah. And I think, you know, the whole idea that. The, the biggest challenge is we no one knows how long they're going to live. So the only way to guarantee you don't outlive your money is to have some sort of uh, fixed rate that you can live off of. Let's just use 4%. And really the idea is if you're drawing 4%, 4 you want to live off of the, the dividends and interest and not touch the principal. But the idea is if you take 4 hopefully – the account is growing by five or six. So each year you get kind of an automatic step up. If you're taking a fixed percentage and that million dollars goes to 1.1, well, now you're getting 4% of, of a higher number. So it works really well. Everyone's different. Um, you know, we've stretched it out 
higher to five or six percent but the more conservative you are especially when you first retire the first year or two is is detrimental one it's new you, you know you have to budget you're not you're not you're replacing your your salary so you kind of ease into it and you can increase that decrease that but yeah the 3.6 i haven't i haven't heard that one but it it makes sense yeah, I, I think that one of the things to point out when you say you take out 3.6, you take out four per year, per year, it's from that day you retire. So let's say you retire at 62, which half of America does, and you plan a 30 year horizon. So living until 92, which would put you definitely winning the longevity game, but not the the, the biggest winners as far as people who to 100. But that first year you take out that 3.6. When you increase it the following year, you don't base it on what the balance is for, you know, if performance was good or performance was bad. You only increase it based on what inflation was. So a couple of years ago, we had high inflation rates of seven, eight percent. And you probably saw with Social Security, they increased through their cost of living adjustment uh, a pretty significant amount. Prior to that, most years it was zero or very small amount. They were increasing that number. So if you did have a million dollars and took out 40,000, well, next year, let's say inflation was four percent. We're only going to increase that 30,000 by 4%. So it's not going to go, well, now the account's $2 million. I'm going to take out 80. No, to make this work, because we want to be ready for ready for this technical term, bad timing. We have to be ready for that, for those bad years where we have like a 2022 where both stocks and bonds fall, or you have a year like 08 or 2001 where they fall tremendously and they stay down for a while. Uh, to be able to survive through that, another key part is rebalancing. So having a strategic asset allocation or having a manager that makes sure that, hey, this portfolio is still in line. So um, it is not that simple, uh, even though we try to make it simple and kind of have a rule of thumb. Yeah, and it's a good point. Uh, there's something called sequence of returns, which essentially is just kind of luck of the draw. You know, clients that retired in 2007 versus clients that retired in 2012 had a whole different experience because you had a massive market crash versus a almost 10 year run where the market went, went straight up. And one thing that we spent a lot of time on is stress testing the portfolio to say, okay, well, what happens if inflation goes up by 5%, social security gets cut, taxes go up and you have a bad market environment. Can you still retire off of this dollar amount? So we always want to leave a significant cushion because we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what inflation is going to do. We have, you know, educated guesses and we have, we have ideas, but it's so important to stress test the portfolios prior to that date. And sometimes you might find out that, you know what, maybe I do need to work another year or two, or I need to drastically cut back on, on my savings or just my expected income and what that, what that's going to be. And it's usually a combination of all the above. Yeah. And along those lines, it, you mentioned that taxes, they can take a big bite out of your return. One of the reasons we encourage people to wait until they take money out of the IRA is, you know, if you're going to pay a 23 or even a 30 percent rate on taxation, that's as if the market fell 30 percent this year. Um, and if you felt that it would feel awful. Right. But you do that every time you take money out for taxes. So having, we'll say, tax diversification. So if you have a brokerage account, a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, uh, a passive income investment that you know has rental property that maybe you have to take depreciation on. Uh, you have personal savings and you have all these different buckets to pull from. You can be very clever to keep your overall tax rate low. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's all about net net at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the majority of folks, uh, most of their money is is pre-tax. Um, so there's not much you can do about that. You're going to be at ordinary income. However, you should be at a lower tax bracket in retirement. But to your point, there's definitely a strategy be, behind where you take what money when, um, because it's all about tax sensitivity at that point. Yeah, and it's never too late to think about taxes. So even if you already are retired, uh, there's some things you can do like a Roth conversion to convert some of the money. Maybe it's a bad year in markets and you say, I want to convert certain parts of my portfolio. Or you say, well, I'm not going to work this year. I might retire. I might take a hiatus for a year, a sabbatical. So I'm not going to have very much income. It can make sense to convert some of that money uh, now and pay those taxes at a 10 or 12% rate, knowing that in the future it might be higher. And the other part is that investment income that you get uh, off your IRA, that's taxed as ordinary income, right? And so that gets too high. They're going to include Social Security as part of your taxable income as well. Uh, if you keep that number low, let's take it out of Roth, out of personal savings, and only a little bit out of the IRA, you might have a Social Security benefit that's not taxed at all, which is better. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and that's and that's a whole other. You know, there's 464 different ways to take Social Security. Uh, most of us know, <laughs> you know, three. It's 62. Wait, the I thought there's early, on time, and late. What are, what are, what are the 462 yeah, other ones? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 62 is the earliest. 66, 67 is full retirement age, and 70 is the last. But there's a lot of different ways to take Social Security, and that's that's part of the the financial plan. And again, everyone's everyone's different. Everyone's in a different position, but. Uh, I mean, it's it, it can't stress it enough. It's it's so important that you have the right distribution strategy, and that doesn't mean hey, I'm about to retire next week. It's there's planning that goes on before that to make sure, to your point, Roth conversions and doing moving around different buckets to make sure that you have the most tax efficient strategy. Yeah. All right. So we go see what uh, our uh, glorious central bankers are up to. Shine those boots. It's time for. Okay. Central Bank Roundup. Let's do it. So, um, interest rates. A lot has taken place over the last couple of weeks. You know, I follow, I follow something that the CME Group puts out. It's just what the what the bond market is pricing in for what the Fed's going to do for interest rates. If they're going to keep them level, if they're going to hike, or if they're going to cut. And for the first time in a couple in a, in a while, the last couple of weeks, there is almost a hundred percent chance that the Fed cuts rates in September. There's a ninety three and a half percent chance that there's a twenty five basis point cut. There's a four point six percent chance that there's a fifty basis point cut, and there is a one point nine percent chance that they leave rates where they're at. Now, these numbers change on a daily basis, but a lot of this is comes off of the, the recent inflation numbers that we've gotten. They're coming down. The unemployment rate is going up, which is what the Fed wants to see. So it looks like we're going to get a from what this from what this uh what the bond market song us that we're going to get a couple cuts this year. Yeah, what I've seen is priced in two for this year, seeing September as well, even though some of the Fed speakers have been out on tour going well, we're ready, but we're not ready quite yet. So it is only July, give them two months. They'll probably be ready by then. It seems that they are eager to cut. And they even said like maybe even four next year. So, you know, cutting interest rates by a point and a half would be helpful for a lot of different people, whether it's high yield companies looking to borrow or people looking to refinance their mortgage. Uh, one of the things that happened in the most recent report was Powell even mentioned the scariest word out there, which is deflation. Um, so the inflation rate fell and he said there's actually some deflationary impulses. Um, which can be, you know, problematic, but projected that we'll reach that 2% magic number sometime in 2025 or 2026. So at that point, they don't want to risk a recession. They'll cut rates um, to get growth back going uh, once inflation is under control. Yeah, you know, the, the question we get asked, or I get asked a lot at least, is, you know, where when do they stop cutting? And, you know, I, I think uh, the, the neutral... The neutral rate, in my opinion, is probably about three percent, one percent over inflation. Which, if they get to two, then the Fed funds rate is going to be at three. There, that last decade that we saw at zero percent was an anomaly. It was way too low for way too long. I think everyone realizes that we're never. I don't think we'll ever go back to to zero. And if we do, it's because we have a massive recession and it'll be short lived. But I think they'll get. You know, we're at five and a half right now, five and a quarter. I think getting down to three. Every Everyone's happy. Um, less money's is more. cheaper. <laughs> less is more. And you know they're 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 in a tight spot. And I've mentioned this multiple times, but just the interest rate bill that we have that the Fed has to pay every month is eighty billion dollars a month. They're going to yeah. hit one trillion this year just in interest rate payments. So well, they uh, they need to cut for no other reason than that alone. Well, reputationally, what they usually do is they wait too long to cut the first time. And then they have to cut aggressively because they held it high too long and caused a recession. So, you know, fingers crossed that doesn't happen this time. Um, but let's go quickly abroad. We're going to not talk about the ECB and some other people because we want to focus on uh, China. That seems to be the hottest game in town, um, not unlike the U.S., but in a much more extreme way. They're having a bit of a regional banking crisis. They've had a ton of banks get closed down. They're having their central bank, the PBOC, intervene in their currency as well as their bond market uh, to try to basically manipulate it uh, for their own benefit. Most of this is coming from a collapse in housing uh, and other real estate. And the lenders of all those are primarily regional banks and they are having their SNL crisis, whatever, whatever thing you want to use from U.S. history, 
it's happening over there right now and they have some some major challenges so you know what is the impact you think for the global economy if they are having this crisis um is it something that can be ignored is it something we got to take note of tom no, I, I think it, it definitely can't be ignored. I mean, say what you want about China. Outside of the U.S., they are second in line for their participation in global global GDP. So a lot of growth comes from there. Mm-hmm. You know, look up, uh, you know, Google Ghost Cities. I mean, it's amazing what they've built over the years where there's these massive, massive cities, everything from malls to buildings, and there is no one that's ever occupied them. So they, they've did this massive infrastructure and this massive spend, which some would argue was why their GDP was was so high and there's there's no one living there. So, you know, the, China kind of comes in and out, I feel like every three or four years about this slowdown. And, uh, you know, they make up a significant part of global GDP. So I think it is something. Yeah, no, it's definitely something to watch. And, you know, what's funny is that right across the, uh, the sea from them, the Bank of Japan, loves intervening. They're, they're very active. They had yield curve control. They did all that. China primarily kind of just wings it and says, well, every once in a while we'll do something. But oftentimes they're acting with their central bank to achieve political goals. Same thing with that buildup you were talking about of having all those ghost cities. Well, you know, that really helped. That helped with investment uh, jobs. Uh, so you had a ton of people working, doing things. Uh, that helps with keeping the peace and keeping stability. So they're not always, we'll say, uh, capital motivated. Sometimes it's more political motivated. But let's uh, move on to our final segment, something or nothing. Let's do it. So we're going to stay in China for this first one uh, and actually get over a city we all know, which is uh, the city of Wuhan, uh, famous for uh, famous for their potluck lunches of millions of people, apparently. Um, So (laughs) <laughs> the future is here, Tom, but it's not evenly distributed. Uh, Baidu, which is, we'll call it Chinese Google, uh, probably not quite as good, but they have 300 robo-taxis in operation in Wuhan. Uh, they have no driver, no humans involved. Uh, is Chinese tech going to beat the U.S. on something? Are them getting their robo-taxis rolling around sooner than the U.S. something or nothing? Well, I, you know, I, there's there's robo taxis here in, in in the U.S. I think they're in four cities: it's San Francisco, L.A., Las Vegas, and, and Phoenix. And funny enough, in San Francisco, they had a robo taxi that uh, that hit someone, ran him over, and five minutes later, another robo taxi came and dragged that person twenty feet. <laughs> So there was a lot of controversy. That's not a good thing to laugh like, about. I, I hope the person's okay. It, but it, it, the idea of these robots yeah, just coming in the, and like causing problems is what we're all afraid of. Cruise. That's the first thing they did. I mean, well, I mean, we're, I mean, that poor person. What are the odds of getting hit by a robot taxi? Can't get up, and then another robot taxi yeah, yeah, comes and drags you twenty feet. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> not great. These robots yeah. are already coming for us, Tom. We just let them out on the street. You know, there, there's, there's been a lot of talk about these robot taxes. One is just they're just not profitable right now. They're just way, way too expensive. The technology that's that that's involved, um, you know. But there's a lot of there's a lot of countries right now that are investing in it. The 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 Saudis just put a hundred million dollars into a Chinese startup called Pony AI. Um, I think eventually they, they will be here just like everything else, but it's just a little a little too – I'm not getting in a robo tax anytime soon, let's just say that. Yeah, it would depend on the type of car, right? If it's a Volvo that has this reputation for never having any fatalities, all right, maybe I'll hop in. But yeah, Chevy Cruze, no thanks. I'm, uh, I'd like to get there safely no, more than it better, uh, without a driver. It better be a dump truck. That's the only way I'm getting in a, a, you know, Dane, in, in a Dane taxi. Cook had a joke about that. He was going to buy a dump truck and put all his buddies in there just rumbling around in the back. It'd be the best drive. Like, you know, you'd pad it, of course, so you could bounce around, but it'd be a lot of fun. And yeah, anyway. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, I also read that China is actually starting to sell some of this uh, autonomous technology because they are ahead of the curve than, than the rest of the world. And, um, they figured they could probably make more money selling it to, to the U.S. and the U.K. and and everyone else. So, so we'll see. I feel like the Chinese are always a step ahead when it yeah. comes to tech. They're hustling. All right, so let's jump over to India. Um, stock market's hitting all time highs. 
uh, India has been growing like crazy for the last couple of years. Uh, what, what, are, what are your thoughts there? Is this something that we, we should take note of? Yeah, I think the, the way I think of it is uh, India is having a moment. Uh, uh, they're on the headlines everywhere. They're one of the richest families there, I think it is the richest, the Ambami family is having a wedding and they've flown in elites from all over. Even Mike Tyson is there. Uh, Justin Bieber performed, Rihanna performed. Like it's, it seems like quite the party, a good time. Uh, they're shutting down traffic. They kind of own this one like area and they literally shut it down that part of the city for this wedding, which is wild. And like you said, the stock market's hitting all time highs. They just had an election that went off, not without a hitch, but uh, the result exactly wasn't what it expected and things are okay. And then even Martin Wolf of the Financial Times uh, is kind of suggesting that India is going to become a superpower. It's a matter of when, not if. Uh, so I think it's definitely something that we should pay attention to. It's something that is real. And, you know, if the U.S. and Russia are going to fight over Ukraine and China and the U.S. are going to fight over Taiwan, once we all get done destroying each other, India might be the only game left in town. So they could end up as the sole superpower uh, after those kind of wars take place. But in the meantime, they just seem to have a lot of action going on. Economy is growing, I think, like consistently for like 15 years, they've been close to double digits. Uh, and it seems sustainable as well. I mean, the number of people going from, let's say, object poverty to lower middle class to middle class and further, I mean, those tailwinds can really go for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the fastest middle class uh, growers in, in the world right now. I mean, they have, what, 1.4 billion people mm -hmm. in, in, in India. Um, talking about GDP, I mean, they've been growing at 7 8% clip year over year, which is, which is massive. And depending on where you look, and I don't know if, they, people just can't get good numbers or not, but they rank anywhere from three to five on the contribution to the percentage of global GDP. So they are definitely something. And if you look at some of these projections of where India is going to be over the next five or 10 years, it is it is definitely, definitely something. Yeah. And a lot of it's low hanging fruit. So Procter & Gamble is over there. And one of the things they're trying to do is get people just to use detergent. And so they're going at all these villages and trying to come up with pods and go here, here's how you use this. And so when you have a consumer products company that goes in and goes, this is our chance to sell people soap and other toothpaste and basic items like that. And now they have the disposable income to buy those. I mean, we know the playbook just, you know, right. We kind of know what people want and kind of expect and a little bit better in healthcare. And, you know, a lot of this is low hanging fruit to, you know, proper sanitation, like, this level of development, well, you don't yeah. require AI chips. It's basic stuff. So I think the yeah. can really go for a while. Yeah. And there's so much, there so many companies outsource. I mean, you look at the big four uh, CPA firms, they mm. all outsource all of their work to, to India and there's tech and uh, there's a lot going on. So they're, they're on the radar for sure. Yeah. All right, Tom, we're going to go to uh, another continent our third one for the, or maybe the fourth for the podcast. Uh, the European Central Bank, commonly known as the ECB, has issued a warning over shadow banking risk. So specifically, Elizabeth McCall, who uh, is retiring at the end of this year from her advisory supervisory role, uh, cites the Archegos incident, which, you know, as a reminder, one guy basically took to a bunch of different banks and said, here, I have collateral. Can you let me borrow? And did that loan several times, which is obviously fraud, um, but he was able to get away with it. She cites the long-term capital management collapse as evidence that private firms and private credit, when things go wrong, don't stay private problems. And it requires, whether it's the Fed or the ECB or some other regulatory body to come out and do something about it. So Tom, is this just a parting shot from a frustrated bureaucrat or is this a wise warning from a central bank soothsayer? No, I mean some of these some of these firms, like the one you just mentioned. I mean, they were ten billion in size. So these are these are these are big numbers. And you know, shadow banking for those of you that that may sound familiar. I mean, that's one of the reasons that led to the the great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. It's all shadow banking is. It's basically uh, a financial institution that's not a bank that does lending. So think you know, hedge funds, insurance companies. Um, in this country, it's a lot of private equity, uh, mortgage lenders. In private equity, investment bankers, private credit. So, you know, people don't want to just rely on going to a traditional bank for lending. So there's other sources of it. And, you know, you look at the hedge funds in our country, I mean, Citadel and Millennium are 120 billion in assets combined. So this has been going on for a while. I don't think there's the leverage in the system that that led to the, the great financial crisis. Um, but, it, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know if it's something or nothing. I mean, you would have to have a lot of these uh, 
private institutions go belly up for to make a, a, a like you said, go from private to, to public as far as the impact goes. But it's been going on for years. I don't think anything's going to change. It's less regulated. Um, it's 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 essentially just private lending. So I think she's more frustrated than anything. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a huge issue. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I think that maybe some of it is, whether it's the Fed here or the ECB there, they say, well, yeah, we do oversee the banks and we make sure that they have the right you know, capital withstand losses and so forth. But these private credit and private groups, they don't oversee them. They don't have to go in there and make sure they have proper collateral. So if things go wrong there, uh, somebody is going to have to be involved to fix the problem when it happens. And I think ultimately the frustration from somebody like her is, you guys are going to call us to fix this problem, but we don't have any oversight to prevent the problem from becoming a problem in the first place. So she had some good examples. I think Archegos and long-term capital management are great examples of where you had problem, but they were able to deal with them and they were small. So maybe there's a key, like uh, not too big to fail, but a certain minimum size that you go, okay, well now we have to come see your books, uh, whether you're the ECB or the Fed, even if you're not a bank. Yeah. You know, the whole too big, too big to fail. I mean, you know, 2008 was a great example when Bernanke and Hank Paulson locked all the big CEOs into a room and told them they weren't leaving until they figured this out. Yeah, so $2. I think if it ever gets that bad, uh, I'm not, I'm not overly, overly concerned about it. Um, and by the way, the, these, these, these institutions are part of the reasons why the world goes around. They give lending to people that can't normally get lending and they give, they can have very significant returns as well. So, not an issue. Well, speaking opinion, of but... lending, uh, our final kind of prompt for today is Peloton, the famous cycling company. Uh, they also have a rowing machine, a treadmill, and all kinds of things going on. Uh, they recently raised funds through the issue of a convertible note, um, which is a new type of financing for them. They previously just issued shares when the stock was high at much higher levels at one point. Um, this time, they got to pay 5.5% to get $350 million, uh, just to keep their operations going. So uh, is there kind of a canary in the coal mine here is Peloton's change in their ability to raise cash unique and a problem for them, or are we going to see this from a lot more firms going forward? No, you know, doing a convertible note isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of reasons why a company will, will, will do it. But when you have a company like Peloton, which by the way, they hit $167 a share during the whole 2020, the meme, craze and everyone was buying a Peloton because no one, no one could go out. Um, it is now down to $3 and 63 cents a share. It's dead. I think this is their last, uh, their last lifeline and, you know, issuing five and a half percent convertible note, which all that is, it's a loan that converts into equity. I mean, you dilute the shareholders, you start losing control of the company. And this, in my opinion, is basically their their last lifeline. Maybe they're hoping that they are a takeout target and, and get bought out, but this is only going to get them so far. I haven't looked at their balance sheet and I don't know what it looks like, but I can't imagine it, it looks good. So uh, something for them for sure. But you see convertible notes all the time uh, on the on the business side, and there's re there's reasons why you do and, and and don't issue them. Well, I hope they survive. I've got a 27 week streak. I'm trying to keep going on that bike, so uh, if I'll be the last one using it, uh, hopefully 270 weeks from now. But uh, I, I I just hope they keep it going because otherwise I got to start over with some other thing, right? And got to hit reset. Yeah, you might. Maybe after you're done with your Peloton, you can go walk over to Blockbuster and get a, a <laughs> you nice You know, there's DVD still one watch. left, right? It's in Oregon. We'll, we'll make a pilgrimage at some point. Go back and- Is there really one left? There's one left. <laughs> I, huh. Yeah. I, I don't know if they have VHS or DVD or what's in there, but there's one. <laughs> it, it basically should be a museum or a mausoleum. Right? This, right? So. I can still, I can, I can still, I still have that smell when you walk into that place. Yeah. What a, what well, a great childhood memory childhood, blockbuster. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, they did have a chance to buy Netflix and declined. Um, so maybe uh, they uh, <laughs> possibly regret a uh, thing they didn't do. How about that? Jeez. All right. Well, we'll end there and uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll pick back up with some of these tax regulations that you were talking about uh, on the front end and some of the things that are possibly coming down the pipeline. Sounds good. You've been listening to your Money Momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to GWAdvisors.net. Thanks. And we'll see you next time on your Money Momentum.
All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.